So in the Here and Now series, we're walking through what does it mean to, to be living in the kingdom of God now? Because the kingdom statements that Jesus made, he made them all the time. The kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like. And, and today we're going to deal with, with what I'm just going to call three truths to overcome the unknown. Three truths to overcome the, the unknown. One of the one of the things that ministries taught me, and it's not something that I learned in a class or, or read in a book, it, it's just, it comes from dealing with a lot of people over time. When you deal with people, you, you're constantly dealing with stories, and you're dealing with context, and you're dealing with people walking through situations that can get really strange and really difficult. And, and, and a lot of times, people find themselves in situations, and things get really foggy and and in my mind, the way my mind works is uh, symptoms versus disease, right? Uh, we, we all, hey, we're, in a, we're, we're still working through a pandemic. We all understand there's symptoms, but then there's the disease, right? Well, the, the, the reality is so many times what I've learned in my own life when, when things get a little foggy, the symptoms can really, those are the things that drive you crazy. The headache, you know, the body aches. All the stuff, the congestion, the fevers, the, or, you know, all the symptoms of, of arthritis, you know, I got a little bit of that in my right knee, you know, and, it, and every time it, I, I load up to jump, it reminds me I'm 48. And, um, it, it, but it's the pain. Pain is a symptom, but the problem is something else. And, and so a lot of times what happens is symptoms create drama. Right, and, and let me tell you, for all of you business leaders, I'm telling you that this is a principle that I've learned just in leadership is if you're tackling a problem in your corporation or you're tackling, tackling a problem in your job, a lot of times the symptoms will make you think they're the disease, but they're not. If you get to the disease, you, the symptoms take care of themselves, right? If you get to the disease, the symptoms take care of themselves. And so right now, we're in the middle of, of a, a, a very... A very unrest time in, in really not just America, the world. Uh, it, there's just a lot, there's a lot of things at play in our culture right now. And when things become unknown, a, a lot of things can, can get off track, derailed, and, and truly just confusing. And so as we look at these kingdom statements, I want you to turn this morning to Matthew chapter 13. Now, in, it's the first gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope you have your Bible with you. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's the first gospel, Matthew chapter 13. If you're on a device, uh, New American Standard is, is what I use. And if you want to go with that version and... If you ever wonder why I use the New American Standard, there's other great translations out there. I pretty much use it just because uh, it... It doesn't read as easy. It, it's a little bit harder to read, but, but uh, it, it is truly the, 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 the closest thing you're going to get in the English translations to the originals, and, and all my professors used that back in those days, and so you just kind of got used to it. But, but um, the New American Standard, uh, this, now, now Jesus is talking a lot about the parable of the sower, and then he makes a, a turn right here, and he begins... He keeps on with another parable, and Jesus is talking to the, to the disciples, and he says this, Matthew 13, verse 24, verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So he owned it. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares, or that's, that is wheat, uh, weeds. It's, if you're into flowers or any type of weeds, it's, it's basically a, a darnell. And he sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, that, that takes a while, you know. And, but when it eventually sprouted and it bore grain, the tares became evident also. The weeds became evident. So... The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed? Well, how does it have tares? And the owner said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? And he said, No, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. You see, the, 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 the root system gets intertwined. and So at verse 30 he said, Allow both... To grow together until the harvest. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, and then gather wheat into my barn. Okay, so Jesus loves telling stories, and he, he's really good at telling simple stories. And so uh, this story pretty much, for the most part, has what I would just say three, three main players. Okay, and the three main players are here. Okay, you've got the farmer who represents God. You've got the farm hands, that's us. And then you've got the enemy, which obviously is the devil. And that's pretty much the three key players. The reapers are in there too, but, but those are the three key players. Now I want to tell you something about the wheat and the tares right here, okay? I'm going to talk to you this morning about God's control over his kingdom. But I, I want to tell you, as you read the Gospels and as you read parables, there's something you need to know. This story, we're going to talk a lot this morning about God's sovereignty. So this story, though, the main line of this story, the baseline, the key point... That, that Jesus is wanting you to understand is actually something I'm not going to preach on this morning. I'm not going to talk to you about it. Because one of the things about the, the, the Gospels, when Jesus gives a story, a lot of times preachers try to get really clever. And I've never been smart enough to be clever, so I just try to be clear. And, and, and so it, it, there's guys that read, you know, they'll, they're very mystical and they'll read things into a passage that really just isn't there. And, and trying to reach too far. This story is really about deceivers and believers mixed together. That, that's the heartbeat of this story. It's about, it's about false teachers or false teaching or deceivers being mixed in with the people of God. That, that's the heartbeat of this story. And we're going to get to that, okay? But there is something in this story, the more that I studied it, I backed up and I went, you know what? We just can't cover there's multiple layers, right? There's multiple layers in this story. And I didn't want to rush through it all in one sermon. So we're going to actually spend the next four weeks unpacking this parable for just a minute, okay? And, and so in this story today, we're going to start with the key player, and that is the farmer, the owner, who represents God. And we're going to, because there is, here's why I chose to slow this thing down a little bit. Even though this story is about God separating the deceivers from the true believers, there are some key characteristics about the nature of God that you can pull out of this. There are some key truths about who God is that I don't want us just to read over for the sake of time and being fast. So today we're going to talk about three truths about the unknown and, and who God is. And I want to start with, as we look at this, as we look at this story through the lens, uh, or we look at God through the lens of this story, I want, to, I, want to, I want you to walk away with one key truth today, okay? And here it is. God never loses control of what he owns. All right, did you hear that? God never loses control of what he owns. He doesn't. He never loses control of what he owns. And, and so what you're seeing right here is that he owns this field. Now, there's been some stuff go sideways on him, all right? But, but the owner never loses control of it. If you look back right now in, in our global human race, one of, one of, the, one of the, the biggest characteristics you've seen in the past two years, give or take, almost two years since COVID came on the scene. What you've seen is, in, in, in a lot of ways, I think it's fair to say what you've seen is global panic. Global panic. You really have. And that doesn't make people bad. It doesn't make, it doesn't make anybody, if you've panicked over COVID, you wouldn't be the only one in this church that's panicked over COVID. We've all had, had our times where we're you know, washed out and messed up and, and, and our brains are done with it and, and all that. We've all had that. But you've seen, you've seen panic on a global scale. And let me tell you partly why that is, okay? Now, hear me closer. You're gonna, or you're going to quote me and say something I didn't say, and that's why we have podcasts, I'll email you and say I didn't say that, right? That, that was pretty good on my feet right there, right? So um, as we're, it's backup. So y'all think it's podcast. No, it's me, liability. It's backup. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, but, the, but the truth is, here's why you're seeing so much panic across the world, okay? 
See, the Bible says this. Now listen to me. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that God has set eternity into the hearts of mankind. Meaning, think of like a cookie cutter. God has taken a cookie cutter and he's molded eternity in your heart, in your soul. You were built for something more. Amen? You were built for something more. And if you don't connect with the God that made you through Jesus Christ, you're going to fill up that space with something else. Guaranteed. See, we were born to believe in something, right? We were born to believe in something. So the reason you see so much panic across the globe is because the God of science has failed in this pandemic. Here's what I mean by that. I didn't say the God of medicine. Praise God for doctors. Man, we got doctors and nurses in this, in this, in this church. Man, listen. What a great time to be alive. What used to, in my lifetime, I'm 48, what used to kill you 40 years ago now is outpatient surgery. It's fascinating. I mean, praise God for doctors and nurses and scientists. But here's the thing. God never commissioned a doctor or a scientist or a nurse or a researcher to save lives. They just postponed death. Do you hear me? They just postponed death. You're all going to die. And so when COVID hit, it's like the whole world all of a sudden went, oh, what happens if I die? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you better be ready for that one. Shocker. I'm not being, listen. We, at, by now, September 2021, listen, there's not a single person in this church. There's not a single person that hasn't seen somebody or somebody that you know somebody who's probably died of COVID. It's tragic. We've had people very close to our family, very close, die of COVID. That's what happens. That's what happens when pandemics hit. It's awful. It's what happens when people, people die when people drive drunk. That's what happens. When people get cancer, sometimes they die. When people get heart disease, sometimes they die. That, that's what happens in a broken world. So it, 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 you, COVID all of a sudden elevated everybody's mortality. And it made everybody go, whoa, what, 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 what happens? What, what, what happens? When I say their God failed them, what I mean is your heart is built to, to rely on something. And so we, as a human race, we keep thinking somehow, some way, some way, if we can get ahead of the pandemic, it'll, it'll cure it. And I'm saying maybe we can, but even if we cure COVID, something is going to take you off the planet. Something's going to kill you. So, so... What happens is when really strange things come up, we tend to get rattled because we're human. So, so what? this is our first pandemic, but it's not God's first pandemic. Aren't you glad? Aren't, aren't you? That was pretty weak. That was like a, 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 that was like a golf clap. You know, good shot. No, no, no. Aren't you, aren't you glad that your God never goes, oh, oops. Aren't you glad God never says oops? I'm glad God never says oops. I'm glad God is going, no, I've seen, I've just, yeah, it's bad. Yeah, but I'm not, I don't know why you're freaked out. I'm not. Because, you know, the, far, the farmer, he never lost control of what he owned, right? Which tells me this. What can we learn about the character of God in all of this? God knows the unknowns, right? God knows the unknowns. You know, a lot of people, in this image right here, a, a, a broken, rocky road, that's how a lot of people's lives have looked. Mental health has gone through the roof in the, in the last year and a half. Suicides in Franklin are drastically increased. It's, it, suicides gone up across the world. People, people are panicked. And, and it's not just COVID-related. Something is happening to our world. But God knows the unknowns. Do you, don't you, don't you, did you notice when you read the story that as soon as the hired hands came and said, Hey, I thought you, I thought you like sowed good seed. I mean, they weren't blaming him, but they were kind of looking at him funny. Like, when you went to the co-op, did you, did you get the wrong stuff? Did you get the wrong seed? Notice he immediately said, No, an enemy's done this. 
Aren't you glad that you have a God that knows what's going on even before you do? Aren't you glad that you have a God that knows what your kids are going through even when you can't figure it out? Aren't you glad that you have a God that is... Now, aren't you glad that you have a God that, that, that... You know, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, like this, this business deal came through like... like I mean... <laughs> it, it was right at the last second, man. And, and, and I said, you know what I've learned, man, about, about God is, uh, man, he's never late. I said, but he's never early either. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's just right on time, you know. But whose time are we talking about, mine or his? It's, it's his time. God, God knows the unknown. He, he knew immediately, and, and, and they were quickly, when you read the story, they were quickly rattled. They were quickly upset, but, but he didn't freak out. God knows the unknowns. And I'll tell you what else. God solves the unsolvables, doesn't he? God solves the unsolvables. He does. I love this picture. You ever, you ever painted yourself into a corner? Oh, maybe not really, because we got words for y'all that do that, right? But have you ever painted your, you ever made a decision and went, a few months later went, wow, I, boy, that was really stupid. Because you don't typically know immediately, right, when you make a stupid decision. <laughs> at least I don't. You know, everything looks good on paper. You make the decision, and you get a few months down the road and went, wow, boy, okay, not only was that bad, that was wrong. Didn't, didn't see that coming. God solves the unsolvables. He does. So many people in their life, they, they get in themselves in, in a place where it's been bad. And, 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 and really, when you look at the story, the hired hands, they didn't know how to handle it. And I, they, they, they really didn't. And I tell you what I do love. I do love that the hired hands had a bias for action. I love that. They're like, hey, let's just go pull them all up right now. I mean, they, they wanted to take action because they were rattled. You ever do that? Like when things aren't going the way you want them to, like you just want to, I'm going to pick up a sledgehammer and start breaking some stuff. I'm going, to, I'm going to see to it that this thing works out the way I think it should. Because this thing's blocking my dream. It's blocking my dream. I had a dream. I had a dream of this perfect career. Now I got a boss. They're out to get me. Right? You ever had, a, you ever had somebody over that you think's out to get you? Whoo. Man, it could make you think some strange thoughts, boy. I'm telling you, don't, y'all are sitting out there looking at it like you're just so holy. Don't tell me you've never had these kind of thoughts, right? Is it just me? No, man. Listen, we are, listen, we are at our creative best plotting revenge, all right? I'm telling you, I'm going to get them, all right? All right, all right. So we, we've all, you ever had a friend, you ever had a friend undermine you? Whew. Boy, that'll take the wind out of your sails, won't it? Hmm. It really, it, it gets hard. We get ourselves in situations, and I love the bias for action. They're like, let's just go pull them all up. What I love is the calm-headed nature of the owner. No, look, if we do that, we're going to lose the whole crop. See, the root system happens. When the, when the darnels, when the tares get in there with the wheat, they get themselves mixed in. And you start pulling that stuff up, you're going to lose all of it. So the, 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 the landowner had the, had the sense of knowledge about his craft to know if we'll just wait to the harvest, we can separate this stuff. See, that's how God is. He, he, he never gets in a place where he is rattled. We get knotted up, and so much of what we get knotted up over, it's not that it's bad. It's just not eternal. So much of what brings stress into my life and so much of what brings stress into your life, if you really can back up and look at the symptoms versus the disease, most of the time what we get really rattled over and really been out of shape over is more symptomatic. It's just not eternal. I didn't say it wasn't important. It's just not eternal. And so we get really rattled up over this stuff. It made me think when I was putting this together today, it made me think about diamonds. The, uh, when, I went to, when I was in college, I remember I had a really good economics professor, and I was never great in economics. Um, he was really good, man. I liked him a lot. But economics, for some reason, I, there was parts of it. The parts of economics that I really understood, I really understood. And then there was parts of it that had to deal with math, which I think that math is kind of dumb. And so I just don't. Come on. That's, 
It's not dumb. Um, I'm going to get in trouble one day for saying that um, because I, I got a good friend of mine that goes here and teaches math, and he's really good. And so I send him text messages sometimes like, Who, whoever cares about what you do, nobody cares about it. it. Your theories are just dumb, and it makes him so mad. I like poking him, right? But, but I, 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 I really... Some of the complex parts of economics I, I didn't understand, but I was, I was very fascinated by economics and how that works and how people can move things around and, and make markets change. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. But I, I did learn about the diamond water paradox, which I thought was neat. The diamond water paradox is just like this. It's, it's really simple. Which is more, it's about supply and demand. It's about value and, and how you place value. And so it's funny how you can take a very small diamond and it costs thousands of dollars but you can't eat it, and it won't keep you alive, but a bottle of water can keep you from dying. But yet, you can get those for free sometimes. So it makes you think, well, which is more important? Because you know, you know, I, this is how my mind works, right? So there's a little bit of a conspiracy theorist in me somewhere. I, I know there is, because you know, you know that some dudes got together somewhere in some country somewhere one day, and one of them had a farm, and he went into some cave, and he saw a bunch of sparkling rocks, and he said, hmm, I'm going to tell the whole world these are the most important rocks ever. I'm going to tell the whole world, oh, you don't have the money to buy my rocks. And somebody's going to be dumb enough to go, oh, yes, I do. And I'm going to save all my money and I'm going to buy those rocks. I mean, yeah, this is how economies get started, right? So I do know a little economics, right? So, so, so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, somebody, somebody somewhere, diamonds meant nothing until somebody said, oh, no, that's the best rock. Look, that's the best rock. You got to have one of those rocks. And, and all of a sudden, rocks get very important, but something that keeps you alive, oh, that's just water. See, so much of what we get twisted up over, pay attention now, so much of what we get twisted up over is we tend to value things that other people tell us are important. Be careful. I've done it, man. I, I, I'm guilty as, as you are in this. Oh, for you, it might not be diamonds. It could be something else. For me, it might be something else. It might not be diamonds. But so much of what we get knotted up over is because we're, if you back up and look at the symptoms versus the disease, we find ourselves placing value on things. I didn't say they weren't important. They're just not eternal. And so what we end up doing is we get in a really bad spot How's it going to turn out? How can I manipulate it? What can I do to make it turn out the way it needs to turn out? How, how, can I, how can I move this and move that and pursue this? And who can I talk to? Because you see, the diamond water paradox is, is, is in, in, in effect, at the end of the day, it's much like life. If we let other people tell us what's important, then don't be shocked if you start valuing things that other people tell you are important. And chasing the things that other people say you should chase. And when you look at the story, the landowner didn't do that. He understood that an enemy had done this. You see, deception, deception is, deception is the main product of your enemy. Deception is his main product. And if he can get you to place value, listen to me now. So this is for some of y'all today, right now. If he can get you to place value on the non-eternal, then he has the keys to dial up or dial down your stress level, right? If he can get you to place value on the non-eternal, then, then you've given him the keys to dial up and ratchet up and ratchet. You've given him the keys to your soul. And the Bible tells me that only God should have control of the, the eternal matters most. So we get in these positions when you look at the, the landowner versus how he responded, you see that we can get pretty cagey when it comes to the non-eternal and rattled over what, what are perceived needs. Boy, this is important. This is for somebody. So much of what anxiety comes from is perceived needs versus real needs. But aren't you glad you have the Word of God that, 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 that tells you this? Philippians 4, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory 
But, but don't read right through that verse. Because that verse is like a warm cup of coffee. Oh, yeah. Mm, that's so good. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches. No, but whose riches is he talking about? His. Did you catch that? He's talking about his riches, not your riches. He's talking about he will supply... God will give you what you need. Oh, he may not give you what you want. All right, hey, can I, can I get a good amen that we serve a God who, praise God, doesn't give us what we want? Amen. Whoo, I wouldn't even be married to Michelle. Right? I wanted to marry every girl I ever dated. Boy, praise God for them breaking up with me uh, over time and for her having common sense, right? And then when we got dated and then she broke up with me, Right, and then I stalked her for 10 months, and then it came back together. See, I just called it persistence. Now they got laws against it, you know, and, um, but that's how it worked, right? I mean, I wasn't too bad, don't think. I, I, I realized later that I did lie to one of my professors um, to get her class. That's a whole other thing. I'm not getting into that. Um, but, but I will tell you, God will supply your needs based on what you really need. I want you really need. That's why Jesus, oh man, listen to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. This is so good, what Jesus said. When he's talking about laying up your treasures in heaven and earth, pay real close attention to what Jesus said. Look right here. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What are we going to wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Seek first the kingdom of God, and he will supply your needs. You know what he's saying right there, right? He's saying the reason that you see society at large panicking when things aren't working out for them is because when you do that, when you do that, you're living as if the You've never seen the true God. Pagans, in other words, he's using unbelievers. Pagans are of, of the Gentiles. He's, the, the, the New American Standard, that's the, I think that's the NLT version. He says, these things dominate. It's, that's why I put it up there. It's such, a, it's such a good commentary on it. These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelieving world. That's what I meant when I said their God has failed them. When, when people, you're built to worship something. You're built to care about something. You're built to let something run you. And so when something other than the, non when the, the eternal runs you, when the non-eternal runs you, then all of a sudden you're gonna, your life is going to mimic the life of the unbeliever. But see, that's not who we are. So what we see about the nature of God, when you look at the parable of the wheat and the tares, is that God knows the unknowns. He solves the unsolvables. Don't lose. We're going to talk about this in a whole sermon in a few, few weeks. Don't lose sight of the fact that from the very beginning, the owner said, oh, there's a harvest coming. There's a harvest coming. Relax. It may not look like you want it to now. Life may not look like you want it to now. Things are going to happen to you now that the enemy does. But don't worry. There's a harvest coming. There's a harvest coming. Which tells me this. When I, I told you that there's some things in this passage that tell us about God's nature. God knows the unknowns. He solves the unsolvables. But I'll tell you what I do find in this passage. God lets nothing undermine his kingdom. Nothing. Aren't you glad? God lets nothing undermine his kingdom. You see, what looked like permanent damage was really just temporary change. It looked like permanent damage, but it was really just temporary change. Some things had gotten sewn in. Listen, there's a lot of comfort in even knowing that even when you don't know how it's going to work out, God does. You don't need to know. It's really okay. You don't, you don't have to try to control all of it. And as I was putting this together, I thought about something that the Word of God tells us. 
If you have a Bible, and I sure hope you do, if you don't, I want you just to listen. But if you have a Bible, I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So just go to the right a little bit, and you're going to hit Romans. Now, your version may not be lined up with my version, but I, I'm going to read something to you this morning, and I'm going to read all of it. We're going to let the Word of God be our plumb line in understanding who God is. And, I, and by the way, I want you to listen. We're going to do two things when we read this together. We're going to listen to who God is, and we're going to listen to who you are in Romans 8. I want you to keep your eyes out for who God is and who you are. It's pretty special. Here we go. You ready? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. As an offering for sin, he condemned sin. In the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled, who do not, in, in us, that is us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, or those who walk according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Verse 8. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong, or the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you live by the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body. You'll live. Verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Not going backward. Verse 15. But you received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, being able to call God Dad. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17, if children, heirs. Oh, don't miss that. You're heirs to the kingdom. Heirs to God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider, Paul says, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory That is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealings of the sons of God. For the creation, he's talking about the heaven and the earth right now. For the for the physical, verse 20. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjects it in all hope. That the creation itself will also be set free from slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. He's talking about life, culture, humanity. He's saying there's a reason that it's all suffering. It's like a, a woman going into labor. There's groans. There's, it's hurting. And not only this, verse 23, but we also ourselves, having been the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. 
In the same way, the Spirit also helps us. See, this is the power of the Holy Spirit in you. He's in verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those, in verse 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So that we would be the firstborn among the brethren. And these who he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he's going to glorify. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? That's you. Who will bring a charge against us? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death or life or angels or principalities or things present or things to come or powers, or height, or depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How about that? You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter. But sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.